What's up, Welltube family? It's Isaac once again. In today's video, I'm here at Republic Testing Lab, and I'm gonna show you guys what to expect at a testing lab, your do's and don'ts. First thing you wanna do is you wanna check in. You're gonna have to show your driver license. They wanna make sure it's you, not nobody else, I'm trying to take the test for you. All right, guys, so I already checked in. Now I'm waiting for the inspector to come give me my pipe, and then I can start my test. Isaac Medrano. Yes, sir, that's me. I'm Scott Witkowski. I'll be your test supervisor for the day. Come on okay. out in the booth. We'll get you associated with everything and familiar. This is gonna be the booth you're gonna be in. You're gonna be in booth number eight. You can go ahead and put your stuff down. We're going to go over a couple things. While you're in the shop, we want to make sure that you're being safe, you know, so you got to wear the proper PPE, earplugs, face shields when you're grinding, safety glasses, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. If you would, read this quick safety requirement and sign your name for me. Sounds good. All welders will wear face shields, protective eyewear, and gloves while testing. Protective eyewear will be worn at all times while inside the shop or testing area. I have read and understand the safety requirements described above. I also understand that Republic Testing Laboratories works for and reports all resorts to the company listed above. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. You're going to be in booth number eight. I've got the machine turned on. You've got your TIG rig in here. So basically, let me give this back to you first. The test you're going to be taking today is going to be a 6-inch Schedule 40 carbon steel pipe nipples. You're going to be welding it out with ER70S2. Mm -hmm. It's going to be in the 6G fixed position in a 45. Okay? Yes, sir. So that's basically going to be the test. What we have here is a copy of the WPS, the welding procedure. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be your, your guide is as of to what your preheat max interpass would be, your amperages, your voltages for the, you know, diameters of electrodes you choose to weld with. We can use 332 1 8 If you were welding in the field and you had big enough pipe, you could use a 532 diameter TIG wire. Mm -hmm. They've got, you know, limitations for that on this WPS. Okay. What we also have on this WPS are, are joint details and fit up requirements. For, for like your root face, you can be a 16th plus or minus a 16th. Mm -hmm. For your root opening, a 16th plus or minus up to three sixteenths. Okay. So depending on what diameter wire you choose to run for your root pass, whether it's three thirty two or one eighth, you can set your diameter accordingly. We'll check it once you get the tacks in the coupon and get it fit in position. So same thing for your groove angle. You're going to be running up to a. It's going to be a sixty degree inclusive. So the bevels on the pipe are thirty degrees plus mm -hmm. or minus five degrees, and and this will be the joint detail that we're welding to today. Okay. It'll be a single V groove. Sounds good. This thing will be on the clipboard hanging on your booth while you're testing. If you have any questions or you're curious about any of the information, there's also a notes page on here that goes over some more pertinent information. If you, you know, happen to need that information, you're more than free to refer to this document while you're testing mm -hmm. as a guideline. And you will also be provided these documents in the field when you're welding, making mm -hmm. production welds for the same reasons. Okay. All right. Yes, so sir. with all that said, we're going to let you get started. Um, you've got a pencil grinder in here to get the inside of the pipe cleaned up if you so choose that you need that. Mm -hmm. Buffing wheels, grinding discs, files. All right, guys, so here I got my pipe, and right now I'm prepping it for my test. Um, you want to make sure you clean the inside at least half an inch back, um, clean your bevels, and clean the, the face surface at least half an inch back. All right, guys, so here I got my coupons. Um, nice and clean. Now I'm gonna get ready to tack. So I have a 316 spacer right here. I'm gonna bend it in half just like that. I'll sit it right here. And I'm gonna put my pipe right on top. First thing you want to do is you want to run your finger in the inside and make sure you got no high low. Make sure everything is lined up. So everything, so I'm pretty good right here. So I'm gonna be ready to tack. Um, 
whenever you're testing, you want to ask the QC um, how many tags he wants. If you're allowed to do bridge tags, some QCs um, might allow bridge tags, some may not. So just it's always good to ask before you tag, because if you do a bridge tag and he wants penetrate tags, he might bust you out on the spot and he's going to send you home. So make sure you always ask what kind of tax he wants. In reference to the tax, you can put fusion tax in the pipe or you can bridge tax. I give you the choice. It's up to you. Okay. okay. Um, as far as misalignment goes, checking the alignment, you're good. You're allowed plus or minus a 16th. Mm -hmm. So when you get it tacked up and you get it lined up, make sure you're within that range. We'll check it prior to running the route pass. So as far as the whole points go today, you're going to put the tacks in the coupon. We're going to tack it in the 6G position on a 45 degree incline fixed. Mm -hmm. I'll come do a visual and at that time I'll check for your gap spacing and make sure your misalignment's good, your high-low. And then we'll continue on with trying to, we'll, we'll attempt to put the root pass in. Sounds good. Okay. Sure. Alright guys, so here I got my pipe nice and tacked. Now I went ahead and did two penetrated tacks. Um, and I did two bridge tacks since the inspector was okay with it. Um, I'm going to tack the penetrated tacks at the bottom at 6 and at 12. I'm going to tack it like this at the 45 position. But first I need to go turn my machine up so I can tack it on there. Alright guys, so now I have my pipe tacked up in the 45 position. Now what you, what you want to do is call the inspector so he can expect the, your tacks. If he, if he gives you the go-ahead, then you're ready to go and start your route. All right, so Isaac's got the coupon tacked in position. So as a quality control supervisor, the weld test supervisor, the first thing we're going to look for is high-low in the, in the coupon to make sure it's within the requirements of the WPS. So looking on the inside of the pipe, the first thing I want to be checking for is a good uniform fit. And as you can see here, He's meeting the requirements of the WPS. The two fusion tacks that he has in the pipe are acceptable. And the next thing I'm going to be checking for is the, the, the gap. So right now he's got a gap of about 530 seconds, just under 3 sixteenths, which is within the requirements of the WPS. All right. So with that said, we're going to let him continue with the root pass. This is the first hold point. He's been successful up to this part, so we're going to let him continue on with his performance qualification. Isaac, it's all yours. All right. <clears throat> so first thing you want to do, guys, is say a little, uh, say a little prayer so everything goes good. <laughs> I'll light a candle for you too, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I'm about to start my route. Now, don't forget to turn it down after you tack it, because if you forget to turn it down, you're going to end up starting about 200 amps on your tack, and you're going to blow a hole. So one of the things that we want to take into consideration that this gentleman's coming in here to take a test, I'm sure he's probably got a lot of butterflies in his stomach right now. So as an inspector that's going to be administering the, the test, you want to give them a little bit of space so that they can perform their weld. So I'm trying to be respectful of his space so he's not as nervous as he you know, could be. Sometimes these welders drive from all over the United States, you know, and have to take a test before they go to work on their last tank of gas. The stakes are high for these individuals. You want to make sure you give them the best chance to, to be successful. We're not here to police these guys and tell them what they can't do or not do. We're here to help them. All right, guys, so I did the fir uh, first quarter of the pipe, got all the way to my bridge tech. Now, now I'm going to start on my right side, because if I end up doing this whole side, it might mess up with my gap over here. So you always want to quarter it. So right now I'm going to feather the bottom. Me personally, I like to always feather because sometimes you do that tag, you might leave a pinhole behind, especially with the 70S2 wire, it's a very dirty wire. Like to leave a pinhole and if you don't feather it, you're going to leave it behind there and if they bend it in that spot, it's going to show on your bend test. And the, you know, the good thing about having, and having the welder two different diameters of wire in his booth is if he goes to run the, the opposite side of the weld and the pipe and, he, and it starts to shrink on him and his gap gets too tight, at that point as a welder you have two options. You can either you know, run the grinder into the gap to try to open it up more, which isn't always the best option, or just jump down a smaller diameter so you, can, you have room to get the wire in the pipe so you can back feed the root pass if you so choose. You know, you don't always get the perfect fit. You don't always have a perfect welding machine. So having the right tools at your leisure help you be more successful. 
And as a weld test supervisor, those are things that I'm looking for from a welder. You know, when he asks for things like that, I want to make sure that he's successful. I don't want to set him up for failure. So the one thing that I wanted to hit on as well, and I may have forgot to mention earlier is, is once Isaac gets his tax in, we get past that hole point and he starts to run the route pass. The second hole point is going to be the completion of the route, but also the clock starts ticking. A lot of times the company set forth time limits on this performance qualification test. So for instance, this six inch schedule 40 TIG all the way out, we would expect to see that weld done in, in about two and a half hours. If it takes longer than that, the time and length that it takes him to make a weld becomes a quality issue. A good thing to have is a bunch of tungstens because if you're going through tungstens, you're gonna waste time. Like the inspector said, sometimes you're gonna be time. And if you're there grinding tungstens, it's taken away from, from your time of your test. As a good point of view or a good checkpoint, the test supervisor just handed Isaac more wire. He should check and make sure that the wire he was handed is the proper wire that's supposed to be used on the test. Right here it has it written, making sure it's a 70 S2. Sure enough, it's correct. So thank I'm you, ready Isaac. To go. Something also that I like to see with what Isaac's doing is, is when he started up on that side, he came, he, he didn't just start right up at the edge of the groove where his tack stops. He, he fired up, he, he initiated his arc slightly back away from the open groove, and he's preheating that tack and that feathered area before he gets there so he can make sure that he makes a sound tie-in. It's very important that the tie-ins are sound. What a lot of people don't realize is 90% of the repairs on these big projects, pipe jobs and vessel jobs are on the root pass. So we need to pay special care and attention to applying that root pass. Normally the fill and cap passes aren't that much of a problem. The root pass is the most difficult part of the weld to make. It's the most important. So you should take the most care and certainty to make sure that you put it in there one time and not have to you know go back and repair things four or five times or find out after the weld's been completely made on volumetric NDE that you had a problem on the root pass. Those repairs are very costly and those are the, the, those are the uh, first things that we're trying to avoid. So now I'm, I'm finishing with my root. As soon as you're done with your root, what you want to do is inspect it. Inspect it before you call QC. Make sure everything's good. Boom, 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 boom. And everything looks legit. So now I'm gonna go get the inspector and see what he has to say about it. Since Isaac's got his root pass complete, that was the second hold point of the qualification. He's called for me to take a look at it. The first thing I'm gonna ask him is, Isaac, did you look at the root pass yourself? Yes, sir. Did you deem it acceptable? Yes, sir. Okay, the reason why I ask the welders those questions is because if he doesn't look at his weld before he calls me, shame on him or her. This is your weld. You want to make sure that you've got it in the way in the manner that you want. Once you call for an inspection, you're telling me that you've approved it yourself. If you call for an inspection and there's issues and indications with this weld and you didn't look at it, from a test supervisor's standpoint, we're done welding. Because if you don't care enough to look at your weld before you call somebody to take a look at it, then that, that type of welder is not what the industry is looking for. We're looking for people that are quality conscious. They're proud of what they can do. We want to see that in the weld. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to check this weld for the visual requirement to make sure the tie-ins are made. I'm going to use a mirror so I can get down in the pipe and a very good flashlight. <clears throat> With today's technology, we, flashlights, you can get a lot for a little in a small package. So I'm gonna do the visual right now. <clears throat> I always start at the top and I kinda work my way around and what I'm looking for with the mirror is I'm illuminating inside the pipe to check the back side of the root. I'm looking for underfill, undercut, things on the back side of the root pass that you normally couldn't see from the front side. And the mirror just helps me achieve that. <clears throat> I'm making sure the tie-ins are sound, <clears throat> that he's got good transition and workmanlike appearance, and I'm looking for consistency. It's very important that what I see is consistent. <clears throat> if the root is really flush on one side and heavy on the other and the tacks are bad and the tie-ins are questionable, then this is going to give me an idea of what this gentleman or lady is going to give me in the field. <clears throat> 
What most welders don't understand is, even though we're doing this <clears throat> test on a carbon steel pipe with 70S2 wire, his code limitation allows him to weld carbon, chrome, stainless of all different series, 300 series, you know, duplex, stainless. So we want to make sure that this welder can weld all those things by showing us what he can do with his or her ability with carbon steel. That may not be as easy as it sounds. The code gives us that requirement and the company may choose to let that welder weld those alloys with this test in the field. So with knowing that as a test supervisor, I have to look at this weld as if it's not just a carbon steel weld. I've got to look at this weld and see if there's techniques that Isaac's putting in this pipe that may cause an issue for an alloy like 308, 316L or duplex. So I'm not just looking at this weld as it's just a carbon steel weld. I'm looking at it for what he's going to be qualified to weld in the field in production, a number of different alloys. So I'm looking for things that may tell tales that he may be, an, you know, give me an issue out in the field with a weld that we may not be able to do. If he was just welding carbon steel, it'd be a different ball game, but he's not. His qualification range is very broad by code. So we need to look at the weld and we're, you know, making sure that his ability is there to cover all those alloys. When I get done looking at the ID, I also like to take a look on the outside of the pipe. And the one thing that I look for are arc marks. Make sure there's no arc marks outside the bevel. And if there are, we may have to address them. If he's got one, maybe two, you could probably let him get away with it. But if there are arc marks all over the OD of the pipe, normally that's a problem. We need to address it with the welder. <clears throat> what I'm looking at right here also is a lot of times you can tell if the root's going to look good by looking at the OD of the pipe, by just how it looks and how it wets in on the sidewall. That's a telltale sign by looking at the OD of the pipe that the ID is probably going to look very similar. A lot of times when the weld from the outside of the groove looks rough, when you go to stick your light on the inside of the pipe, you're going to see that there's an issue there. When you have pipe qualifications that are big enough and they allow, we also want to check for reinforcement. A lot of the codes out there in acceptance criteria give you a 1 8 maximum for bead reinforcement and sometimes it's as less as a sixteenth. So I'll utilize a gauge and I'll slip it in the pipe and make sure that he's not over or under. You want to make sure that the bead's not sucked back as well and below flush. We're looking for flush or at least an eighth or less. Preferably a sixteenth is all you really need. All right, Isaac, the bead looks good. I'm going to check it off on the paperwork and you can run your hot pass. I'm done with my route, the inspector passed it, so now I'm going to do my hot pass. For my hot pass, I'm going to turn it up to about 160 amps. Um, also, the 70S2 wire is very dirty, so after you do your route, you're going to have a lot of silica on the surface of your route. So, what I always like to do is wire wheel it, but sometimes, even though you wire wheel it, it still leaves a little bit in there. So, I always like to scratch it with the grinding disc, that way I get a clean puddle and not a dirty puddle. Again, this is 70S2, 70S6, it's a lot cleaner. Um, you don't always have to do it with the S6, but with the S2 is usually what they have at testing labs. So if you're not too uh, good with 70S2, I suggest you practice because they're not always going to have the S6 at your disposal. For your hot pads, you want to make sure you run hot, not too hot, and you don't want to run cold. If you run cold, you actually end up going slower and you end up putting more heat in your pipe which then causes you to suck that root out. Um, so make sure you burn pretty hot. So my hot pass, I'm going to do it with a 1.8. You should, when you get here, you should have all the things that you need at your hands. If it's so forth, a grinder or something that you want to bring in or your own TIG rig that maybe you like to weld with or your own stinger if you're going to be stick welding or your electrode holder. If a welder's going to show up and he's prepared, that's what we're looking for because that's how he's going to show up to the job. Part of this qualification test is not the ability, not just the ability for you to weld. We're also looking at how you carry yourself professionally. If you show up and you're not prepared, you don't have the right PPPE, 
and you don't have all the tools that you need to be successful, in my mind, I've got to look as, well, how is this individual going to show up when he gets to the job? Is he going to be prepared? Is he going to show up on time? Is he going to be late? Is he going to have his or her tools? This test is basically an interview. You get one shot to impress the uh, well test supervisor, and they're going to have a direct correlation as to whether you may or may not make it on this project or in that fab shop. I can't stress how important enough to make sure that you're prepared, that you're on time, you pay attention, you listen to the instructions, and you ask the right questions. And there's never a dumb question. If, if you've got a question about how to make that weld successful and it's not on the documentations that are provided to you by the test lab or the company that you're testing for on the WPS, ask the weld test supervisor for that information. I mean, this is your test. This is what's gonna matter whether you go out there and make a job or not. All right, so. There's my hot pass. Now, if you zoom in, you can see uh, I got a couple silica right here, um, little spots. So what I like to do, um, I only grind out where I have my silica spots. I grind them off, um, and that way on my fill pass, it should be a clean fill pass, and I should have no silica. So for my cap, I should have to do no grinding at all. So it's usually on the root and hot pass that I grind all my silica. I'm just going to flush it with this pass. Now normally if this was a heavier weldment, we would do an inspection right on the hot pass just to make sure that it looks smooth and uniform. So what I'm going to do here is check the root side to make sure that he didn't suck back anything and everything looks really good on the inside. I'm going to reach around down across the bottom, make sure that everything looks good. He does have an arc mark down here on the bottom of the pipe. We'll ask him to address that when he gets done. That'll be the last thing that he does. I mean, outside of that, the weld looks really good and uniform. Um, one thing you got to take in consideration is that the pipe will get hot because of the length of the material. So sometimes, even though we have time limits on these examinations, you need to let the pipe cool down, especially in the summertime when it's 100 degrees. You know, sometimes you need to let the weld cool a little bit because the inner pass gets a little high. And when they get ready to cap, you'll undercut the top side of that pipe. So we don't want to cause a failure because we're pushing the welder to make the weld too fast. So the test supervisor needs to have a strong welding background so they can make good sound judgment calls when they're testing these welders. Inspectors that do not have welding backgrounds do not make good welding inspectors. I'm just being completely honest here. I might cause some controversy with that statement, but I've proven it right a hundred times. The test supervisor needs to have strong welding experience to make sound judgment calls to be able to put a welder on a job to be successful. I'm going to leave it with that. All right, weld looks good, Isaac. We're ready to cap. Yes, sir. So it is summertime here in Texas, so it's extremely hot. And um, like the inspector said, is the pipe is hot. So if you want to get a nice cap with um, no undercut, it's best to let it cool off about five minutes. Um, I'm under my time, so I'm good. So I'm going to let it cool off. Um, and then I'm going to throw a 2B cap and then we're done and hopefully we get to test it, do a bend test and hopefully it passes. Now another thing to keep in mind is you want to keep your area nice and clean. If the inspector comes here and you have a bunch of rods on the floor, he's going to think you're a safety issue, you know, so he's not going to, you know, want to pass you if, if you're leaving a big old mess behind. You know, it's a safety hazard, so make sure you always keep your area nice and clean, no rods on the floor. You don't want to slip or roll an ankle or anything like that.
Grind off any arc marks that I have. <laughs> so Isaac's got a complete weld here. So the one thing that I'm going to do is the inspector is I'm going to look at my time, and he's well within his time limit. You know, if it was going to, if, if, if hypothetically speaking, he had two and a half hours to take the test, we're only setting at about 45 minutes of arc time. I couldn't ask for a better, you know, uh, time to take this this test. I mean, that's that's you know, uh, from a scale to one to ten, that's about a nine in my opinion for, for time, managing his time well and, and staying with it to keep going. So with that said, I'm going to move on to the visual part. Me as an inspector and a weld test supervisor, I like to go back to the inside of the pipe and just make sure everything's the way it was when he started. And it's as I would expect it to be. It looks good and clean and uniform. Now I'm going to go back to the pipe. Now on a 45 degree angle like this in the fixed position, Isaac took, the, uh, took it upon himself to put a two-bead cap on here, which is fine. The question always comes up a lot of times on a 45 if you can do a one-bead cap. As an inspector and an ex-welder, if a welder is confident enough on a Schedule 40 to put a one-bead cap on something in a 45-degree position and he can make it look good, I'll accept it. As long as he doesn't have underfill and undercut on the bottom of the pipe there on the top side of that weld. Or if you do a multi-bead cap, it's the same thing. We're looking for the same things. A good uniform-like appearance. Make sure that he's got good tie-ins. Maybe that he staggered his stops and his starts. If he's got any visual discontinuities like the tungsten arc nerk that we had on the bottom he addressed, I can't ask for a better weld. Another thing that we look for is in the, that he, put a, he went with a beaded cap is that he's got at least a 50% overlap on his passes for coverage. And he does that. So... As of right now, the weld's acceptable. Being that we're going to do a destructive test today on this weld, the first thing I do is I take my marker and I mark the top of the pipe. The ASME code requires that we take the specimens out of the quarters. So if I don't locate the top of the pipe here, I won't know what orientation to take the specimens. This is very important. So I have to locate the top of the pipe and I'll put his identification number on the pipe so we can keep traceability of it. His traceability number is IQ and I'm not being a smart ass with that. It's just his initials. <laughs> All right, with that said, we're ready to pull the material. I've got my trusty pliers here. Test is over. So where we're at right now is we're going to the machine shop with the sample. So what we have to do is remember in the, in the booth, I marked the welder's identification on here and I marked the top of the pipe. This is important to the correlation of how the specimens come out. Now per ASME section nine and the wall thickness and diameter of this material, I have to do inch and a half wide face and root bends. So I'm gonna bring our technician in and he's gonna set this cut up and rotate and locate the material to take the specimens in the right position. All right, Rodrigo, it's all yours. Okay, so we've gone from getting a welder set up, giving him a test, doing the visual evaluation, which is one of the most important parts of testing a welder is the VT, to, you know, the acceptance of the visual inspection, going to the destructive testing part, prepping the material, and now we're in the lab and we're going to perform the bends. We've got two face and two root bends that Isaac has to pass for him to go get a job. So we're going to initiate the test. So what I'm looking for here is to see if there's any issues, indications, open indications or discontinuities on this strap. And from what I can tell there, the face is right there, the cap, the weld cap has been ground down. It looks like a clean bend, so that bend's acceptable. <clears throat> 
Same thing here, we're trying to look at the strap to see if there's any open indications and the weld looks good from here. On to the root bins. No open discontinuities. Root looks good. That bead looks good too. So we basically what we have is an acceptable qualification test. So this weld's acceptable. Now we've got the destructive testing complete. We're ready to do a certification on this welder and put him to work. So that basically concludes the testing today for Isaac. And uh, I hope you, the audience, uh, you know, get something out of this and can kind of see how things are supposed to work in a scenario of testing welders. Uh, if y'all have got any questions, please comment on YouTube and let us know. And, We'll try to get back with you and see what we can come up with. All right, guys, so there you have it. Um, here are my bend tests. They bend nicely, so I got the job. Remember to hit the, the like button and also the subscribe button. See you guys later.